Hey everybody, uh, welcome to Resurrection Presbyterian Church for our online service. 
This is Sunday, uh, June the 21st. Uh, my name is Matt Grimsley. Uh, I am the organizing pastor of Resurrection and it is my uh, privilege weekly uh, to stand up here and to welcome you in the name of Christ. Whether you're a regular worshiper or visitor, whether you come in joy or in sorrow, in excitement or hesitancy, in belief or in doubt, uh, you are welcome here in the name of Christ. A special welcome to our Far East and Far West community groups who are present here in the space. Hello, hello, yes. Uh, they're present for our recording as part of our phase in uh, uh, process uh, program to get more and more people uh, getting used to being back in the safe in smaller increments right now. But so glad you guys, I'm looking at actual faces in the room now and not just at this uh, machine in front of me. But thank you for being here, you guys and everybody who's watching online. As we enter into worship, let me pray for us. Almighty God, you have made us for yourself so that our hearts are restless until they rest in you. So Lord, as we draw near to you, would you draw near to us? Would you lead us to Christ today? Would you open our eyes that we would see him as more beautiful, as more believable? And then, O oh Lord, open our lips that our mouth would proclaim your praise. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Would you stand here in the room for the call to worship? You can stand at home too if you want. I don't care. <laughs> uh, the words of interest come from Psalm 34, what we just sang. Uh, this is God's invitation for us to come and worship. Would you respond with the bold print? I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Let's sing together.
Brothers and sisters, it is a privilege each and every week to present ourselves before our God in worship because he is worthy, because he is beautiful, uh, because uh, his goodness and his mercy has chased us here. And it chases us throughout the story that we tell in this service of worship. And so in our historic pattern that we're doing, we come in and we say what's true about God, uh, and then we say what's true about ourselves. Because that seems to be the pattern that anyone follows when they come in the presence of a holy God. They acknowledge his glory, and then we see that we are glorious ruins because we are sinful and we know uh, on our own we are not uh, worthy to come before such a God. And so it is good for us to, and to humble ourselves and to pray a prayer of confession to acknowledge our sins, acknowledge the things that we're about to say are too heavy for us to carry, uh, to lay them on Jesus, to hear again that they are forgiven, and to walk away and to be risen up uh, with a new song in our mouth. And so would you join me in this prayer of confession that's written in your bulletin? Let's pray together. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. We've confessed with one voice uh, together. Now let's confess uh, silently and quietly to the Lord. Oh, Christians, lift up your heads, open your eyes. The gospel, uh, on the one hand, tells us that we are more sinful and broken than we even know about ourselves. And on the other hand, in Christ, we are more loved and accepted than we can possibly imagine. So would you hear this good news from Ephesians 5 about the love of your God for you? Christ loved the church, his bride, and he gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, she might be holy and without blemish. Christians, I declare to you the forgiveness of your sins in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you rise, let's stand, and let's celebrate together. Let's declare that our help is in the name of the Lord. Maker of heaven and earth. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouths will show forth your grace.
Christ, uh, we have what humanity needs most deeply. First of all, is peace with God, to be reconciled with the God of the universe, and then peace with one another in the body of Christ. How much is our world longing for some sense of peace and justice in this world? Friends, it comes through Christ. And so after we hear the forgiveness of our sins, it is beautiful and customary that we would greet one another in this peace. So may the peace of Christ be always with you. Would you greet your neighbor uh, at a safe distance uh, here in the room? Greet your household at home at an unsafe distance at home. Uh, and, and maybe since we uh, text people uh, in the church, maybe a couple of people just to extend to them the peace of Christ. That's right. All right, friends. Uh, we are a church that not only has a peace uh, with one another, we also have a vision. And that vision is to be a community that is finding our life through the gospel of Jesus so that we can love God, love neighbor, and bless our city. That's who we are. That's what we're about as a church. And so to achieve this vision, we are committed to three things, sharing a common worship, a common life, and seeking the common good of our city. And so if you look on the back of your bulletin, near the back of your bulletin, actually, next to back, uh, I want to highlight just a couple of things for you that are in our life uh, together right now. Number one, uh, as we talked about, we're apart. We're doing a phase-in plan right now. Uh, towards worship. Uh, you see the schedule there. We're online for today, next Sunday, and July 5th. On July 12th, we'll have an outdoor service, uh, Lord willing, uh, in, uh, in Vilas Park at the shelter there. And then on our plan right now is to resume in-person worship on July 19th. So 4 p.m. back here. It'll be 50 people or less, socially distanced, all the safe things. We will still continue to live stream at that point uh, so that you can watch at home if you need to stay at home. So that's our plan right now, and uh, Lord willing, uh, that'll be uh, the path we walk uh, towards gathered worship again in the next coming weeks. Secondly, under Common Life, uh, really excited about this. Our summer seminars are kicking off actually tomorrow, Monday night um, at 7.30 p.m. We're going to do these over Zoom uh, so we can still limit the times we're getting together. Uh, but this one, uh, I'm really excited about this series. It's what is Reformed Theology? It's talking about a, a, a world and life view and lens through which we can see everything that's going on in our world right now. So we want to begin with one of the most important questions uh, about the Christian faith, which is uh, scripture. What is, what is the sufficiency of scriptures? What is the role of the scriptures in our life? And so Reverend Danny Hyman's going to lead that. And so please tune in tomorrow night, 7.30 p.m. via Zoom. You'll, you'll have uh, it's linked everywhere in our communications. Uh, and so that's all the announcements for common worship, common good, uh, or common life. Under the common good, just want to continue to Remember uh, our mission to Urban and University of Madison and to pray uh, for the things that are going on. Remember students, even though they're spread out and back home, uh, pray for them uh, in, their, um, in their summer endeavors. And pray for secular people. That is uh, right at the heart uh, of why we are here, uh, is to engage people uh, who find the Christian faith implausible. Uh, so continue to pray as we uh, reach out and love our neighbors and engage those around us. Um, that'd be good. So towards that end, uh, it is time. It would be great for us to take up this mantle that God has given us to pray uh, for the world, for the church. Um, and we're going to invite up uh, a member of the Far West Community Group, Parker Nethery, uh, is going to come lead us in the prayers of the people and the kids' lesson. He's going to do a real kids' lesson, unlike me last week. It was real. We just wanted it to come from your parents. Come on up, Parker. You can decide which one was more real at the end. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, on this Father's Day, we pray for fathers everywhere. For those who have given us life and love, and may we in turn show them respect and love. We pray for new fathers, um, for those who are full of hope and starting out on this journey. We pray for longtime fathers who have wisdom from years of experience, um, for grandfathers as well, and for those who are soon and yet to be fathers. Lord, we pray for fathers who have lost a child, whether through death or otherwise. May you give them hope, and may their family and friends give them comfort, Lord. May you counsel them. Hear our prayers, God, for morning fathers. Father, we pray for those who serve as father figures, who are mentors, who 
are being that voice of wisdom and guidance in someone's life? Would you guide them and give them wisdom themselves that they may point to you, O oh God? Father, we pray for stepfathers, those who have assumed that role and gone into that place, um, who have loved the children of another just as their own and created that family. Lord, would you hear our prayers? We pray for adoptive fathers, for those who have heard that call, um, and like you adopt us as children, may they be a shining image of how um, you bring us into your family, O oh God. And hear our prayer for adoptive fathers. Father, we pray for those fathers who have not been able to be a source of strength, um, who haven't gone to the needs of their children and who haven't been able to sustain their families. Lord, have mercy on absentee fathers and on their families. Lord, we pray for fathers who struggle with temptation, violence, and addiction, for those who do harm and for those whom they have harmed. Lord, would you have mercy on struggling fathers. Father, we pray for those who have shaped our lives without the claim of family. We pray for those who have taught us, who have guided us, who have shaped us and molded us into the servants of Christ our Lord. Lord, hear our prayer for the fathers of our faith. And Father, we thank you on this Father's Day, knowing that you are our Father who is in heaven. We thank you that you have shown us this through um, your relationship with your son, Jesus, and that you are living that out as you've adopted us um, through your son's sacrifice. I thank you, O oh God. Lord, may our hearts cry out evermore, Abba, Father, with all the lovingness that that entails and all the respect and honor. May we understand that to the fullest. Thank you for adopting us and through the finished work of Jesus, for freeing us from slavery to sin in our orphan-like ways, for giving us a spirit of sonship, a secure place in your family, and an inheritance that can never spoil or fade, kept in heaven for us. Thank you for promising to complete the work you began in us and for always and only disciplining us in love, even when it does hurt. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray as children before our Father, boldly saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, it's my pleasure also to go to the kids' lesson on Father's Day. I don't think there's a better day to do it, honestly. Um, I remember when I was your age, kids, um, I'd always go to my dad on Father's Day or Mother's Day and be like, Dad, there's Father's Day, there's Mother's Day, but why isn't there a kid's day? And like just something in my head, I couldn't make the math add up. And my dad would always tell me, uh, that's because every day is Kids' Day. I didn't buy it at the time, I want to be honest with you. <laughs> um, but I really, uh, as I've gotten older, I've learned to appreciate that more and understand that because, again, like as a kid, like I'm looking around, I'm like, how is every day's Kids' Day? Like I have to do chores, I have to go to bed early, I have to um, do whatever it is, and it didn't make sense. Um, but what I didn't realize then is that all those were good for me. Um, and as I've gone out on my own and I have to do the dishes and I have to clean up, I realized that my dad was preparing for me. And so on Father's Day, it, we remember him because he's not doing that for himself, even though it seems like it sometimes, and probably he enjoys it too. Um, but he is doing it to prepare you for it. And so today, also, as we're um, transitioning into the sermon, what your parents are going to hear is God um, telling children to obey their parents. And that's something, again, that can seem tough and easy to say, but Jesus himself knows what that's like, too. Jesus' dad also asked him to do hard things and things that he didn't want to do, um, all the way to going to the cross and dying for us. It's a lot harder than doing dishes. Um, 
But it didn't just end there either. It didn't end at Jesus' um, dad, so God asking him to do this really hard thing. But instead, it ended with him being resurrected and sitting at the right hand of God so he can be right by his dad the whole time. Not only that, but like we just prayed, he adopted us and so that we too can be with our dad in heaven and spend time with him. And so as you're on this Father's Day and as you take time to thank your dad for what he's done, even the things that are hard that you might not like, remember that Jesus followed that path too and he's leading us to God the Father through it. Thanks. Thank you, Parker. That's great. As we turn to the reading and preaching of God's word, uh, brothers and sisters, I want to welcome you. Uh, I didn't say it in the beginning of the service, but we are now officially in the season of church life that's called Ordinary Time. Uh, this is the longest stretch of the church year. It spans some 30 plus weeks. Uh, it is the age uh, that spans the time between the first and the second comings of Jesus. So in other words, now. <laughs> now, this is your age. This is the time we find ourselves in. It is the age of the church when God is working through the church and even beyond the church to bring his kingdom to earth, to spread it to the four corners of the earth. I don't know uh, who decided to name it Ordinary Time. I should probably study this and figure it out, but I don't know who decided to name it Ordinary Time, but I'm very thankful because I think it's brilliant, actually, because it does feel very ordinary, doesn't it? Like compared to the stories of the Bible, like virgin births and turning water into wine and blind people receiving their sight and dead people being raised up, our time uh, is, is quite ordinary. It's well-named. It's nothing if not honest. And if we're honest as Christians, if I'm honest as a Christian, uh, we struggle with the ordinariness of the Christian life. We thrive on the extraordinary things, like conferences and retreats and mission trips and mountaintop experiences with God, these things that are mainstays in American Christianity. And I fear that if our relationship with God begins to feel ordinary, that we begin to feel that something is wrong wrong with our faith, we are pining for that next experience. Uh, after living and working in college towns for the last 15 years of my life, uh, and having a church here that is very young, has a lot of college students as well, I truly believe the transition from college to after is one of the most difficult in all of life. Especially if college was like this season of intense spiritual growth for you, but even if not, it, because whatever comes after college will definitely be more ordinary. Just will. Church is more ordinary than campus ministry. Life is more ordinary. Going to work, trying to find time for friends, maybe getting married and having kids, which sounds exciting, but is also sometimes quite ordinary. And grocery shopping and making budgets, and changing diapers. I think sometimes we can wonder, was this a bait and switch? <laughs> I was kind of ex sold this exciting journey with God for my life long, and is this it? Or is there something wrong with me? Is there something wrong with my faith? The question is, how do we thrive in the ordinariness of the Christian life? But friends, the subversive truth of ordinary time is that God is just as present and just as active in the ordinary as he is in the extraordinary. Ordinary time tells you that God is always at work, even if he's working through ordinary means. Brothers and sisters, God is still healing through doctors, medicine. God opens blind eyes every time the gospel is preached. God raises the dead every time someone believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is a sheer miracle. Dead people are walking. See, God is in the ordinary, if we have eyes to see it. So therefore, it's a perfect time for us to return to our series on Colossians as we look today at the sufficiency of Christ in daily life, in the ordinary. And it is absolutely no accident that Colossians 3 begins in heaven and ends at home. It starts with setting our minds on things that are above where Christ is, and it ends with living the life of heaven in your living room around your kitchen table. 
in your cubicle at work. And this, is, this is intentional because this is the ordinary arena where you will live out the life of heaven. It is in these relationships with spouse, with children, with bosses, with employees. I love it. God, Apostle Paul doesn't leave it ethereal, some sort of heavenly mindedness. He brings it all the way down to the practical, to the ordinary, to daily life. So friends, let's listen. Let's hear how Christ is sufficient even for our daily life. And as we read this, I will give a disclaimer that I, I know there are a couple of things in this passage that are sometimes difficult for modern people, but hang in there. We're going we're gonna to talk about it. All right, Colossians 3, I'm going to start in verse 17, one verse before what's printed, through 4, 1. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, Submit to your husbands, as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. And whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray before I preach. Oh Lord Jesus, I pause uh, to acknowledge and thank you for your word, for your gospel. Lord, that we don't have to wonder uh, what the truth is about God or what the plan of salvation is. You have wonderfully given it to us in these sacred words. But also acknowledge, Lord, I am not sufficient enough to speak it, and we are not sufficient enough to understand it without the Spirit of God. So Holy Spirit, come and do what only you can do to Open eyes and open ears and open hearts and give us faith to believe. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. There's a psychiatrist from Stanford University that wrote a book that I read a couple years ago that's called Virtually You. And it is subtitled, The, Danger, the Dangerous Powers of the E-Personality. It's a book uh, that it helps us grapple with how our online lives what they're doing to our actual lives. And how there's usually a difference between those two things. And the author writes that one of the massive side effects of our online presence is, what he, is that we have developed what he calls visions of grandeur. <laughs> visions of grandeur, which he defines as this, an exaggerated belief in one's importance and one's abilities. <laughs> Ouch, right? But it's true because of the proliferation of internet success stories. Companies like Google and eBay and Facebook, and because of YouTube sensations like Justin Bieber and Gangnam Style and whatever else has happened recently, I don't know, right? The internet has promised to make us all rich and famous, and we bought into it. We believe, all of us believe it is within our grasp. We are obsessed with being discovered in some capacity, with going viral, with becoming important, in the cultural landscape. We have visions of grandeur for our lives, which means that one of our worst fears is being in insignificant. Friends, the problem with this, there's multiple problems with this, but one of the problems with this is it has carried over into our Christian lives as well. We have visions of grandeur of what we can do for God or what God is asking us to do. It permeates every vision statement of any, every church ever, especially church plants. Right, we're going to change the world. Bigger is better. Right? We're looking for impact. We're looking for influence and importance. And guys, these aren't all bad things because God does amazing things. But I think the irony is, is that these visions of grandeur makes us look right over the impact we could have in the ordinariness of daily life. So oftentimes we dream of loving our neighbors that we don't know 
while we are a jerk with the roommates we do know. We dream of loving children in third world countries while we are negligent in loving the children in our own home. Sometimes we dream of serving the the bride of Christ, the church, while we are harsh or demanding with our actual brides in our homes. We dream of starting a successful Bible study at work. This is the way I can be a Christian in my workplace while we are late or lazy or just a poor employee. We dream of creating a more just society while we are unjust with the people directly under our supervision. Do you see it? The visions of grandeur can make us neglectful in ordinary life. And the result is that the people closest to us often get the worst of us. Brothers and sisters, this should not be. In contrast, the Bible actually, I think, gives us the freedom to dream small. To focus local, to simply be faithful in ordinary life. You know, the same author of this letter, the Apostle Paul, once wrote another letter to the Thessalonian church who was living in a very secular world. And here's how Paul said you can change the world. Are you ready for this? He says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands. You don't hear that in many commencement speeches, do you? Or in many Christian books. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Life. Now, friends, I know we have had times in the church of idolizing domestic life. That the end-all, be-all of life is to have a family and to raise them up, and everything revolves around that nuclear family. And I think we have rightly critiqued some of that. I think Jesus critiqued some of that when he says, whoever does not leave father and mother is not worthy of me, he says. we got to grapple with that. We should not idolize family, but friends, that doesn't mean that we should pendulum swing and ignore it either. In other words, it is okay to aspire to lead a quiet life, to be a faithful spouse, a parent, employee or employer. These are holy callings. With this, we should be content. God does not require more of you. You don't have to change the world. God's changing the world. Because I don't think it would be a bad thing if we, when we ask our kids what they want to be when they grow up, if they answered, you know, I want to grow up to love one woman for the duration of my days. I want to love my kids and teach them to love, and I want to work hard with my hands. That's beautiful. In a book called The God of the Mundane, the author provocatively writes this, but I say, be nobody special. Do your job, take care of your family, clean your house, mow your yard, read your Bible, attend worship, pray, watch your life and doctrine closely, love your spouse, love your kids, be generous, laugh with your friends, drink your wine heartily, eat your meat lustily, be honest, be kind to your waitress, expect no special treatment, and do it all quietly. Friends, I'm here to tell you as a As a new 40-year-old, the older you get, you will see this is the stuff that really matters anyway. The rest is fleeting, like chasing after the wind. Friends, it's no accident that so many New Testament writers directly apply the gospel of Jesus to daily life, to your home life, to your work life. This trinity of, of marriage and family and work shows up many times in the letters of Paul and Peter. Because this is one of the primary arenas where you will live out your faith. Eugene Peterson, who's one of the greatest authors to help me wrestle with God in the mundane, in the ordinary, he writes, the only opportunity you will ever have to live by faith is in the circumstances you are provided this very day. This house you live in. This family you find yourself in. This job that you have been given. But brothers and sisters, there's actually a deeper reason that the New Testament writers talk so much about the gospel in daily life. You know why? If you think about it, these were the first three things that were cursed when mankind fell into sin. Think about it. Remember the story in Genesis chapter 3. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned against God, curses were brought upon God's perfect world. And those curses were aimed especially at family and work. 
You remember it? Childbearing was cursed. Childbearing will be marked by pain. Not just in the actual delivery, I believe, but for the duration. Raising up kids will be like those birth pains over and over and over again. He's saying you will suffer to raise up your children. All the parents said amen, right? <laughs> Marriage is cursed. Marriage will be marked by conflict. Husband and wife opposing each other for control and dominance over the other. Born of this mistrust that the other actually has your best interest in heart. And then work is cursed. Work will be marked by futility and by frustration. Metaphorically, the ground now works against us. It bears thorns and thistles. We will work, we will toil by the sweat of our brow. Friends, it makes sense. Since these were the first things that were cursed, it makes sense that these are also the first things that the Apostle Paul seeks to apply Christ's work of redemption. In other words, work and family are fallen in Adam, and work and family are redeemed in Christ. This is why it keeps coming up. In Christ, they are redeemed. But friends, I want to tell you, they are redeemed for a purpose. Not, that you, not just we would have more enjoyable families and jobs, though that's great, that's nice. But it's so that the world would get a glimpse of God and his story through our family and our work. Listen, God has made these institutions signposts to reveal himself to the world. It means as we live out the story of redemption in our family and at work, the world actually gets a better picture of who God is, what his good news is all about. They can see him in us. That's what it means, our opening verse. It's what it means to do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name, you are his representatives of his name on earth in your home, in your workplace, wherever you go. So let's ask, what do these redeemed roles look like in daily life? Well, Paul begins with wives. Verse 18, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now listen, I know this verse has gotten a really bad rap in our culture because we hate the word submit. All of us hate the word submit. We all hate to submit to authorities. I do. <laughs> I have an authority problem. To authorities, to uh, parents, to institutions, to the law, to bosses, you name it. But friends, especially in this context of marriage, it feels in our culture regressive or misogynistic to ask especially wives to submit. Friends, we forget that Paul also wrote emphatically elsewhere in Galatians that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. You know what he's saying? There is no hierarchy in the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying. Paul was actually incredibly progressive for a Greco-Roman world that, that did not see men and women as equals. Sometimes I think Paul's up there going, come on, guys, I was actually way ahead of my time. But furthermore, friends, the most, you know who the most submissive person in the whole Bible is? Christ. Christ. It is Christ who submits to his Father in the work of redemption. Even though he is completely equal with God, he submits himself to the Father's will. Parker talked about it. Friends, if it is possible for Christ to be simultaneously equal and yet submissive within the Trinity, then it must be possible to be completely equal and yet submissive within a marriage relationship. It does not mean you are inferior or lesser. Moreover, as my friend Sean Slate says, submission is not just a woman thing. It is a Christian thing. We are all called to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, Ephesians 5.21. All Christians submit to one another. Husbands and wives submit to one another. And yet within marriage, Paul says, it is the unique role of the wife to submit to her husband. Why? Why is this? Friends, remember Genesis 3. Marriage is now beset by a conflict for power and for control. And submission actually sets the wife free from sinful control and anxiety. Similar to that control Eve took in the garden by leading Adam to that forbidden fruit. Guys, far from being restrictive, it is freeing. 
to trust your husband to lead you, to love you, to have your good in mind. This admonition to submit says you, you don't have to control everything. You don't have to worry over everything. You don't have to manipulate. You can trust your husband. And as you do, you actually show the world a picture of the church who submits to her husband, Christ, because she, she is convinced, utterly convinced, that he loves her and he is always working for her good. Next, Paul speaks to husbands, verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Likewise, how do you set a man free from passivity? Like Adam exhibited in the garden as he stood by and let his wife entertain something he knew that God had forbid. Or how do you set him free from being a power trip, from being domineering in the conflict for control in marriage? Friends, the answer for both of these is love. Love. You cannot be passive and love well. It requires activity, intentionality, forethought. And friends, you cannot be domineering and love well. Paul explicitly says to not be harsh with our wives. Why does he say that? Because we are so tempted to be. To love as Christ loved the church requires self-sacrifice. To put the needs of your wife above your own. To delight and cherish this gift that God has given you. And friends, as husbands love their wives, they show the world a vision of Christ. Who loved his bride even unto death. Even death on a cross. So that she would know true love. So that she would be made beautiful in his love. Also, husbands, as you sacrificially love your wives, it makes it all the easier for them to submit to you and to trust you. All the wives say amen, right? Paul continues, now he speaks to children. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. This is fascinating. In a world where children were of little importance, Paul honors children by speaking directly to them. He says, children, you too have a role in playing, role to play in showing the gospel to the world. As you obey your parents in everything, you show the world what every child of God is called to do. To obey the Lord while trusting in his power and in his goodness. Again, in the Garden of Eden, the first son and daughter of God doubted their father's love. They doubted his goodness. They took matters into their own hands and they disobeyed God. That they wanted to be their own parents, to be their own authority. And this displeased the Lord. Because so much of the pain of childbearing is when children want to be their own parents. To be their own authorities when they doubt their parents' wisdom or goodness or love. And they have a workaround. They take matters into their own hands. But Paul says when children obey their parents and trust... This is so pleasing to the Lord. He loves it, and it shows the world what it means to be a child of God who trusts and obeys our Father. And conversely, then Paul speaks especially to fathers. Verse 21, fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Literally means don't embitter them. Don't make them bitter. Fathers, you get to show the kindness and the gentleness and the long-suffering of your heavenly Father. And how many times has he been patient with you as you learn to obey him? So too, be patient with your children as they learn to obey you. And do not provoke them, or they will become too deeply discouraged. Fathers, on this Father's Day, I want to say you will never regret being tender with your kids. I've never, I've yet to meet a father who said, you know, I wish I wasn't so patient with my kids. Never. And lastly, in this litany of daily life, Paul turns to the work relationship. He addresses masters and slaves, which is also troubling for us. (laughs) Because we have this deep history, we have everything that's going on in our world right now, this history with chattel slavery in the U.S. And so we bristle at this. What is he talking about? Guys, you need to know that slavery in Paul's day was similar in slavery today because slaves were seen as property. But it was also substantially different. 
It was not race-based. It was not perpetual for your entire life. It was not even necessarily abusive, though it could be. I think this explains why Paul does not advocate for dismantling the whole system of slavery. He assumes that in the realm of work, there are always going to be superiors and subordinates, bosses and employees. He's just saying this is how it works. So this is how we should interpret it and how, sh- how we should apply it to our day. Bosses and those who and workers, employees and employers. But notice, friends, for workers, Paul sets them free, sets us free by giving them a new master and a true reward. Look at verse 22. Bond servants, workers, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Paul says, I get it. The fallenness of work means that our earthly bosses are sometimes horrible. But in Christ, you are set free to not ultimately work for them. You work for the Lord. You work for his eyes, for his pleasure. Which means you work hard no matter if your earthly boss is watching or not. It's like me when I'm doing these group exercises at the gym. You know, when the trainer walks by, I'm really working on my sit-ups. And when he walks away, I lay flat on the ground. It helps explain this figure. Friends, you work heartily for the Lord. Not for the men. Not for the eyes of men. And you work for a different reward. Not just for recognition and remuneration and retirement. But for the inheritance of the Lord Which, friends, is nothing less than the new heavens and the new earth. Can you imagine what it was like for slaves who owned nothing, who were entitled to nothing, to hear that one day they will own the whole earth as co-heirs with Jesus? That is our ultimate inheritance that we are all working towards, and our work actually contributes to that inheritance. And now for bosses... For employers, Paul says, you get to show the world the justice of God. Verse 1, masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Every master has a master above them in heaven, and he shows no partiality. He will deal justly with you and with the whole world, and so you get to deal justly with those who are under your authority. This is it, friends. This is the vision of a redeemed home, of a redeemed workplace. This is the vision of of Christ being sufficient in our ordinary and daily life. And brothers and sisters, in keeping with the theme of this letter, Christ is sufficient for this too. He is sufficient for your daily life. Look to him, study him, copy him as you live out these roles in these important relationships. I am still, uh, admittedly, a massive fan of Saturday Night Live, even though I know it's mostly trash now. <laughs> it's like one good sketch every, every weekend. But one of my favorite parts all times of SNL are the impressions. They're amazing. Tina Fey as Sarah Palin. Will Ferrell as Harry Carey. <laughs> I love that one. Bill Hader is basically anyone. <laughs> He's so good. But friends, what, what we don't see What we have to imagine is all the time they spent making these impressions perfect. Studying film over and over and over again. Practicing to get the voice just right. Standing in front of a mirror to get the expression just right. And the result is something amazing. It reminds you of the real thing. Brothers and sisters, this is what Paul is calling us to. To spend hours and hours and hours studying Jesus. So that when we speak, when we act, when we play our roles at home and at work, it reminds everyone of someone else. It shows the world Jesus and the ordinariness of our daily lives. That'll change the world. Let's pray, friends.
Lord Jesus, thank you for ordinary time and thank you for a gospel that speaks to the ordinariness of our lives. Lord, whatever you call us to, I pray you would help us to be faithful in the little things, to do little things with great love, knowing that in our marriages, in our families, in our work, Lord, because you were risen from the dead and because we work for you, our labor is not in vain. Our inheritance of a new heavens and a new earth stands. It is kept in heaven waiting for us until it comes down. So Lord, give us strength to live out the gospel in daily life. May our friends and neighbors in this world, when they look at us, see Christ because of the way we are in our homes and at work. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Friends, I want to invite you uh, to response always when the gospel goes out. We, we hear that the, the word is not in vain. It, it, it causes, it has power to, to change things in us and in the world. And so fittingly, we respond. And first way we respond is by confessing our faith. What we're saying in 1 Corinthians 15 is we're rehearsing the gospel and remembering as a result of all this, our labor, our work, our ordinary daily life is not in vain. So friends, let's confess. Dear Christians, let us remember what has been delivered to us as of first importance, the gospel which we received, in which we stand, by which we are being saved. That Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, all in accordance with the scriptures, that he has been raised as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. For he must reign until he has put all things in subjection under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. On that day shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Therefore, we are steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord our labor is not in vain. Friends, our labor is not in vain and our giving is not in vain. Lord, each week we, we gather the loaves and fishes from God's people and he multiplies them to do his work in the city and throughout the whole world. We continue, please continue to remember us giving online. You see the address in our bulletin there. Lord, your, your sacrifices, your gifts, your generosity is not in vain. It causes the gospel to go out to our city. And lastly, friends, I want to tell you, your waiting is not in vain. I know you've been waiting to come to this table. We've been lamenting that we can't be here. And yet, it, the, near, the end is in sight now. <laughs> we can see it. But even now, we, as we long for it, we still remember everything that this table points to. That we are Christ's body. That he feeds us and he nourishes us and he sends us out to be his ordinary witnesses in our ordinary lives. And so, we remember what this table points to. That Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. And because of that, I hope we know that our labor is not in vain. Would you stand and let's sing this closing hymn together.
Friends, thank you for being here with us as you go. Uh, as we just sang, the Lord goes with you. His blessing goes with you. His very spirit goes with you. And so we always end every service with a good word, the benediction from our God. Would you open wide your hearts and as an expression of receiving your arms to receive the blessing of God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thanks be to God. Go in peace, friends.